As most of you know, I have recently been going through the book of Proverbs topically. I've taken one topic after another and analyzing what the book of Proverbs said about that particular topic. The topic for today is the heart. And I want to begin by saying that in essence, what the scripture is teaching in the book of Proverbs on that subject is that the heart of the matter is the heart. The word heart appears in Proverbs 85 times. Now, it's a little tricky. Matter of fact, the word heart in the Bible is a little tricky. The Hebrew word heart can mean the inner person, the mind, the heart, the understanding, the thinking, the conscience, emotions, and passion. I think what we ought to settle on is that it's just talking about the inner person. In some, pers in some passages, it's talking about the mind. In other passages, it's talking about the will. In still other passages, it's talking about the emotions. And sometimes it's even talking about the conscience. And maybe we could say uh, that's the inner person. The Bible does not analyze the individual like modern psychology does. It uses the word heart for the whole inner person. And I think I might argue that what affects the mind affects the emotions, and what affects the emotions affects the mind, and so forth, and that just saying it's the inner person is not bad. However, there are passages where it means one aspect of the person, even in the book of Proverbs. For example, in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, clearly, that's uh, using the word heart as part of the mind. In Proverbs 5, 2, it says, My heart despises correction. Well, that's more emotion. In Proverbs 3, 1, it says, Let your heart keep my commandments which is obviously more the will than anything else. And then in Proverbs 20, verse 27, it says, The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. And commentators conclude that that one is talking about the conscience, that the conscience is a lamp. It throws light on the thoughts and the motives and the affections and the actions. Now, the New Testament would say that it's possible for you to have a good conscience in 1 Timothy 1.5. It would also say it's possible to have a seared conscience in 1 Timothy 4.2. So that the conscience, uh, when it's working properly, is a good guide, uh, but it can be perverted and even seared, cut off, so that you have no conscience anymore. At any rate, the word heart in the scripture is talking basically about the inner man and sometimes focuses on one aspect of the inner man. Perhaps we could say this is just who you are. I heard somebody say once, uh, what you are really like is what you're like in the dark. And perhaps, and not bad. But from a biblical point of view, it might be more accurate to say what you really are is what you are in your heart. Now, that's just sort of the introduction to this subject. What does the book of Proverbs say about that innermost part of our being? Well, I'm going to make four statements, the last of which is the most important. But let's start by just making the statement that the book of Proverbs, in essence, teaches that the issue is the heart. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Proverbs 23, verses 6 to 8, say this. Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, 
he says to you, but his heart is not with you. The morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. By the way, this is one of those phrases I think is quoted a lot in the book of Proverbs. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The, the, the context of that is really interesting. The, the, the point is, you're eating with a miser. So he's invited you to dinner, and you're eating his food. And he's a miser. So he says, help yourself, have more, enjoy. That's what he says. But as he thinks in his heart, that's what's really going on. He's counting the cost of every spoonful, and he doesn't like it. There's tension created. As a matter of fact, the proverb in chapter 23 says, the morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up. Meaning the whole situation is uh, an irritation to the point that you're not enjoying the meal. Uh, you're going to throw it up. And then it ends by saying, waste your, uh, and you'll waste your pleasant words. So that if you compliment him on the food, or say pleasant words, it's not going to do any good, because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your compliments are wasted. Don't waste your breath. Now, the point I want to make is that the issue is the heart, not of a speech. So you're eating with a miser, and it says, he says, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. So it's not the speech, the heart of the matter is the heart. You got to know what they're thinking to know who they really are. Or take another proverb. In Proverbs 14, 13, it says, even in laughter, the heart may sorrow, and the end of myrrh may be grief. Now, this one's interesting. Even in laughter, the heart may be sorrowful. So, this is the case of the sad clown. You heard of those cases? Where they're laughing and having a good time, but inside... They are hurting so that the external appearance is camouflaging what is really going on in their heart, which is hurting. And the joy of the moment may end up in grief, which is the latter part of that proverb. Now, again, it seems to me that these two proverbs are saying something similar. And that is that the heart of the matter is the heart. So you don't just pay attention to what they're saying. You got to know what's going in the heart, what they're thinking. You don't just watch the fact that they are laughing because what's going on inside is they may be hurting. I know of cases like that as a pastor. I think I have uh, known people that seemed happy until they met with me in the office and I found out there was a lot of hurt in that heart. Or one more in this category. In Proverbs 15:15, 15, 15, it said, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. Now, what is critical here is the word evil. The word evil actually means distressed or misery. So this proverb is talking about being afflicted in some kind of misery. But the latter part of the proverb says, but he is of a merry heart as a continual feast. So this is the opposite of the proverb I just mentioned. In this case, the person is under distress. The person is in a miserable situation. But it says the heart's merry. So a person can be laughing and have a hurting heart 
Or a person can be in an absolutely miserable situation and have a merry heart. Someone has said, those with a happy heart can sing in prison as well as in the palace. It's an interesting idea that it's not your circumstances, it's what's going on in your heart. So you just don't look at their speech, their laughter, or their miserable circumstances. The heart of the matter is what's going on in the heart. For example, suppose I told you that an older man was having pain, uh, numbness, weakness, and coldness in his arms. You might say, what you need, sir, is more exercise. Or, suppose I told you the pain was in his neck, his throat, and in his back. And you say, well, maybe you need stretching. All of that may be true in some circumstances, but what I just described to you are the symptoms, along with some others, of heart disease. So that the ones we're familiar with are things like shortness of breath and chest pain and angina, which is chest discomfort. And we then know that the problem is not the pain in the arms or the legs or the neck or the back. The problem is the heart. So God looks at the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. The heart is the heart of the matter. Not the circumstances, as we saw in Proverbs 15.15. 15. But the heart. It's not the environment. It's the heart. The heart is the heart of the matter. Now, what we need to do is a little heart surgery. Let's uh, go peel open the heart and look in it and see uh, what are the possibilities. The first thing I said about the heart is that the heart is the heart of the matter. The second thing I want to say is the heart can contain vices. A number of proverbs talk about that. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is in bullet point fashion mention a dozen proverbs. Now, I don't expect you to follow <coughs> excuse me, all of that in the passage. But I want to just point out all the different things the book of Proverbs says can be in your heart, which could all be called vices. For example, Proverbs 6, 18, a heart devises wicked plans. Proverbs 6, 14, perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually, and he sows discord. <clears throat> Proverbs 6.25, do not lust after her beauty in your heart. Proverbs 7.10 refers to a crafty heart. Proverbs 12.20 says deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil. Proverbs 16.5, every proud heart is an abomination to the Lord. 17.20, he who has a deceitful heart finds no good. 2215, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. 2317 instructs, do not let your heart envy sinners. 242 warns, for their hearts devise violence. 2623 describes a wicked heart. 2814 talks about the possibility of people having a hardened heart. And 31.6 shows that people can have a bitter heart. Did you get all that? Can you repeat all that? All right. I listed 12 proverbs. Uh, there are 12 vices. Actually, the word wicked is uh, repeated in two of them, so maybe there's 11. But here's what's going on. Wickedness, perversity, lust, craftiness, deceit, pride, foolishness, Envy, violence, wickedness, hardness, and bitterness. That's all in the heart. So, 
No wonder Proverbs 28, 26 concludes, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. All right. Jesus said, Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That's in Matthew 15, 18, and 19. So out of the heart can come all kinds of evil and wickedness. I'm calling it vices. A young boy asked his mother if he could help her wash the windows. She welcomed the offer and told him to begin with the ones in the kitchen because they were the dirtiest. So he went outside and worked diligently until he thought he was clean. Then with a dry cloth, he rubbed it until his arms were tired, but the pane of glass still had smudges. Frustrated, he called his mother and asked her what was wrong. Looking at what was done, she smiled and said, Why, you've been spending all your time washing the glass out here. The dirt is on the inside. That's what Proverbs is teaching. The dirt is on the inside. That's what Jesus taught. Out of the heart proceeds the dirt. It's not the action, it's the heart. The heart is the heart of the matter. The other thing I found in the book of Proverbs was that the heart can contain a lot of good things. So I'm going to call these the virtues that can be in the heart. Again, I want to bullet point them and just lump them together. But listen. Proverbs 20, verse 9, refers to a clean heart. So does Proverbs 1, 19, verse 9. Proverbs 22, 11 affirms that there can be purity of heart. 15, 18 indicates that a person can have a righteous heart. Proverbs 2, 10 speaks of wisdom entering the heart. Three, verse 3 says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you, write them on your heart. 17.22, a merry heart does good like medicine. 27.11, show that there can be a glad heart. Now, I didn't go the whole dozen. In that case, there are only eight. Uh, but just listen, a clean heart, purity of heart, a righteous heart, Wisdom, mercy, truth in the heart, a merry heart, and a glad heart. So the heart is the heart of the matter, but the heart can produce vices and it can produce virtues. So it's no wonder that Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. The heart can contain vices as well as virtues. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Now that one is in Matthew 12 verses 33 to 35. In Matthew 15, Jesus said, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts and so forth. But in chapter 12, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So, again, it can either be vices or virtue that's coming out of the heart. Last week, I um, was talking about faithfulness. And I mentioned the fact that faithfulness is rare. There's a proverb that speaks of that. And in order to illustrate that, I went to the parable of the sower. And I conceded that Jesus, there's no hint in that passage, that Jesus intended for us to apply that parable mathematically 
but uh, if you could divide it mathematically, only 25% produce fruit and only a third of those produce 100%. Uh, so I ended up saying faithfulness is rare that you get to maturity and produce fruit, and I figured it's somewhere around 8%. Now, I'd like to go back to the parable of the sower, and instead of using it as an illustration, I'd like to interpret it. It illustrates what I think Proverbs is saying at this point. In Luke chapter 8, uh, Jesus gives the parable and then he gives the interpretation. Now, there, it's called the parable of the sower. I think it should probably be called the parable of the soils because there are four types of soils. The first soil is called the wayside. And as I explained last time, there was a path in the field that they walked on. And by repeated, repeatedly walking on that particular portion, it packed down. It would be like saying some of the seed fell on the sidewalk or some paved portion of the property. Then he talks about rocky soil. Now, the, the seed and the rocky soil germinates. Uh, it springs up. Only, as Luke says in chapter 8, uh, they believe for a while. Now, this is a huge interpretive problem. Uh, theologians like to debate about this passage. In the first part of the passage, it said the seed that fell on the wayside, the pavement, di didn't penetrate. And the, the birds came along and snatched it away. And Luke says, lest they believe and be saved. So clearly, believing gets you saved, and they didn't believe, so they weren't saved. So the great debate is over. Uh, the next soil is the rocky soil, and it says they believed for a while. And that's the debate. Can you believe for a while and not be a genuine believer? Well, I would argue that in that passage, the seed germinated. It produced life in that case. And uh, it says they departed. And that very word is used in Hebrews chapter 3 of believers who departed when they got to Kadesh Barnea. So while that's not the majority report... I think the second group of people are believers. The third group is it fell among the thorns. And again, it germinated. But this time, the weeds, the thorns, and the thistles came along and choked out them. So that, and this is what Luke says, it didn't grow to maturity. So he's acknowledging they are believers. He says that. They didn't grow to maturity. And then the fourth type of soil he calls good soil because it produced fruit to maturity. Now, those are the four kinds of soil, and I believe the last three are believers. What's going on here? Well, the second group, the rocky soil, had some, it, it's, it says rocky, but it, had, it must have had at least a thin layer of dirt on it for, because it germinated. So I'm going to call that a shallow heart. Then what about the, the third group where it, it germinated, it grew, and then the weeds, so to speak, choked it out? Well, here's what Luke says. He says uh, their growth was stunted because they were choked with the cares, riches, and pleasures of this life and therefore did not produce fruit to maturity. That's Luke 8, 14. All right. I'm going to call that the crowded heart. That it got crowded out. They didn't grow to maturity because they were too concerned about the cares of this life. Or they got all wrapped up in riches or the pleasures of this life. And isn't that the kind of stuff the scripture repeatedly warns us about. And we can get all caught up with possessions or pleasure 
or just the cares of life and not grow spiritually to maturity. Now, I said all of that to get to the fourth group. The fourth group is called good soil. And this is what the text says in Luke 8. The seed fell on, quote, good ground and produced fruit. Jesus said, they heard the word with a noble and good heart and kept it. They heard the word and they did what it says and therefore they produced maturity. But what caught my attention is he calls it a good heart. And that's what made me work backwards and say, well, if that's the good heart, what kind of heart do these other types of soil had? And I concluded a hard heart, so the word doesn't penetrate. A shallow heart, so there's no depth and therefore there's no real growth. A crowded heart, you get crowded out by the things of the world. Or there's a good heart and you produce fruit to maturity. By the way, is it possible that the first three that trip people up are the world, the flesh, and the devil? Clearly, the first one is the devil comes along and snatches the seed. The second is tribulation. Matthew says persecution, trials. Uh, the individual didn't have the endurance to keep going. And the th Third is clearly the world, the cares and pleasures, uh, riches and pleasures of the world. So it's the world, the flesh, and the devil that will prevent you from going to spiritual maturity. Unless you have a good heart. And if you have a good heart, you will produce fruit to maturity. Jesus calls it a noble and good heart that keeps the scripture. So, the heart is the heart of the matter. Because out of the heart can come vices and can come virtues. Both can come out of the heart. Now that leads me to my fourth point. The first is simply the heart is the heart of the matter. The second is that the heart can be filled with vices. The third is it can be filled with virtues. So what's the bottom line? And this is where we need to camp for a minute. What's the bottom line? This time I want you to turn to the passage. It's Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs Chapter 4, verse 23. Now, we're going to talk about this verse in a little bit of detail. So I want you to turn to it. You got it? Here's what it says. It says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of of life. Keep your heart, for out of it springs the issues of life. This is the point about the heart that the Solomon makes in the book of Proverbs. Keep your heart. Now the Hebrew word translated keep means to watch, to guard, to protect. And the word diligent means diligent and watch and guard. Uh, this is the way the Hebrew language is constructed. Uh, but keep your heart, guard your heart is the idea. And do it with diligence. Uh, or as one translation states, with diligence. Uh, just make sure you keep that heart. Uh, now, I think that uh, we should add somewhere in this discussion that the heart can be influenced by outside forces. 
environment can impact you. Uh, circumstances can influence you. But in the final analysis, from a biblical point of view, you need to guard your heart and not be influenced by those negative, sinful, external circumstances and environment. Now, what I want to do at this point is I want to mention a couple of other Proverbs that say something similar to this. And then I want to come back to chapter 4, verse 23. So hey, keep your Bible there, but let me mention a couple of other things before I come back. Proverbs 22, verse 5 says, Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from them. Perverse here means twisted, crooked, perverted. Uh, in other words, they're not going down the straight path that God intends for them to go. They uh, wander off of it. So he is saying that that kind of a path is filled with thorns and snares, all kinds of difficulties and trouble. In essence, then, it's saying something similar to 423. Guard your heart. Keep your heart. Don't stray away because there are all kinds of um, snares in that path. He says in 22, 5, guard your soul uh, and be not far from them because there are thorns and snares in the way of veering off that path. Same idea. So, uh, imagine a guard at the door. And that's a military concept, so I don't know that, that we relate to that very well. So let me bring it up to date. Um, have you been shopping lately? Have you gone into any kind of a business where there was somebody standing at the door and making sure you had a mask on? Have you? Have, you? have some of you done that? All right. I think that's a more up-to-date illustration. But the point is, there's a guard at the door. And that's what the passage is saying. Guard your heart. Keep your heart. Don't, don't veer off the path. Guard the heart. Let me give you uh, what I think is even a more critical issue. He says in 1414, the backslider in heart will be filled with his own way, but a good man will be satisfied from above. I got saved in a Baptist church down in Florida and in those Baptist churches where I got saved and grew for a while, they always talked about backsliding. I don't hear that term like I used to. The Bible talks about it, but not a lot. This is one of the few verses that talk about backsliding. You ever heard about backsliding? It shows your Baptist roots. All right. This verse says, the backsliders in heart will be filled with his own ways. So the first part of this proverb implies that the backslider moves away from God's ways. The second part of the proverb, a good man will be satisfied from above, implies that he moves away from God. So he moves away from God's way because he moved away from God. Otherwise, he would be satisfied with things from above. So some backsliders not only turn away from the Lord, they are satisfied in doing things their way, not God's way. That's the point he's making here. So, if I were going to do a flow chart of this on a board, I'd do it something like this. You start out in fellowship with the Lord, and you follow His ways. Then you slide away from the Lord, and then you get satisfied with your ways, which probably involves sin, and that's being a backslider. You have slid away from the Lord. So guarding your heart 
means keep your focus on the Lord so that you don't go down a perverse way. And you don't slide away and be satisfied with your own heart instead of the Lord. A preacher of many years ago said, It is a miserable thing to be a backslider. Of all unhappy things that can befall a man, I suppose backsliding is the worst. A stranded ship, a broken winged eagle, a garden overrun with weeds, a harp without strings, a church in ruins, all these are sad sights. But a backslider is the saddest sight still. Don't backslide. Don't slide away from your focus on the Lord. One more before we get back to chapter 4. In 27.8 he says, Like the bird that wanders from its nest, is a man who wanders from his place. And again, the idea is we have a place. It's with the Lord. It's going down his way. But you can wander away from the Lord. You can be like a bird that wanders from its nest. And as we've seen those Proverbs say, that is headed for trouble. Now, if I were going to sum up everything I've said thus far. I would say that these verses in Proverbs talking about the heart are saying the heart is the issue because it contains either vices or virtues. So don't turn away from the Lord. Keep your focus on him. Don't backslide. Guard your heart. Did that come through? Guard your heart. All right. This is going to take a minute. I'm not done. I want to go back to chapter 4, verse 23. And I want to look at that verse in a little more detail. Uh, I put this whole series together um, before I even started. I have all the topics all laid out. I have them prepared except for digging up an illustration or two here or there. And so I spent some time this week, again, looking at this passage as I had organized it. And I then had a conversation with my brother. He lives in Dallas, as you know. And I was telling him about some of the things I found out in this and as you know, he's a therapist, and uh, we were talking about guard your heart and how important that is. And my brother told me something I'd missed. And it's all in 423. Look at the verse again. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. And my brother said, that word issue can be translated border or boundaries. Now, I had uh, looked at the Hebrew lexicon and I didn't see that, but there is a fellow named Strong and he translates it that way. Interesting. That guards your heart, for out of it springs the issues of life, the boundaries of life. And then my brother said this, he said the next three verses tell you what the boundaries are. Now, I looked at my notes when I had gone through that passage and I had uh, divided it a little different way. I said in the overall context of chapter 4, the subject is wisdom. So everything I'm about to say is living a wise life. What my brother did is uh, relate the next three verses to verse 23. And I must say, this has some possibilities. And when you talk about guarding the heart, these are three areas in which you need to guard the heart. So let's look at them very quickly. Look at verse 24. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. 
So he says, guard your heart in verse 23. And the next thing he talks about is your mouth. And I'm reminded again that Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if you're guarding your heart, you will guard what you say. In this case, you won't use deception. You won't have perverse lips. You'll guard your heart, and that will result in putting perverse speech far from you. In Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul lays out some sins, and he makes an issue out of lying. Don't lie. And he structures the passage in such a way as to suggest that that is the one thing you better not do. Because if you go around deceiving and with perverse mouth, you're not going to grow to spiritual maturity. Did you ever hear about the bar that was named The Office? There was such a bar. The owner gave it that name so customers could say to their wives, I'm at the bar. That is the kind of thing he's talking about. But the man's problem was not his speech, it was his heart. Or look at the next verse, verse 25. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. And the point is that you look straight ahead, unswavering toward a goal. Keep your eye on the goal. Don't let anything distract you from moving toward your objective. So the point is, keep your focus. I mentioned this a minute ago. Your focus needs to be on the Lord. So if you're guarding your heart, you will keep your focus. Paul said, this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He kept his eye on the goal. That is guarding your heart. When you get your eye off the goal and you look at something else, there will be problems. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Do you remember Lot's wife? The angels told uh, Lot and his family to get out. <clears throat> and they got out. And Lot's wife turned and looked back. And she turned to a pillar of salt. Now, the problem was not her eye. The problem was her heart. So guard your heart. Keep it focused on the Lord. Again, look at verse 26 and 7. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. In other words, again, don't be sidetracked. Keep focused. And as that proverb said a minute ago, we looked at, keep your focus on the Lord. Don't get sidetracked. There is a story about <clears throat> several artists who were asked to illustrate the concept of temptation. One depicted a man uh, a, trying to achieve fame and fortune at any cost. Another drew a picture of a man struggling against the desires of the flesh. The prize-winning canvas portrayed a pastoral scene in which a man was walking along in a quiet country lane with shaded trees and lovely wild flowers. In the distance, however, there was a parting of the way, a divide in the road, one leading to the right, and one leading to the left. 
And the point was, the problem with temptation is that it's subtle. It appears as an innocent-looking fork in the road. But Jesus said, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witnesses, and blasphemies. You can think of the temptation as a fork in the road, but the problem is not the feet. The problem is the heart. So this is the point. The bottom line, as far as the heart is concerned in the book of Proverbs, is that you should guard it. It is the heart of the matter. It determines what comes out of your mouth. It determines the direction you should go. It is the heart of the matter. It's an inside job, folks. It's a matter of the heart. So guard your heart. Keep your focus on the Lord. And that means you will watch what you say and you will watch what you do because your eye is on the goal of not sliding away from the Lord. The whole point is the heart of the matter is the heart. It's an inside problem. It's an inside job. Keep your focus on the Lord. When a group of soldiers were told that they would be shooting at targets for a prize, they prepared their rifles with great enthusiasm. One young man showed up with a sparkling clean weapon. He positioned himself and with a sturdy hand and clear eye, he pulled the trigger. But his bullet swerved to one side and missed the target entirely. He later found out there was rust inside the gun barrel. For days he had polished the outside but had failed to clean the inside of the rifle. Guard your heart for out of it are the issues of life. Father, thank you for giving us this warning, putting your finger on the heart of the matter, that we are to stay focused on you and not veer to the right or to the left with our words or our actions. Thank you, Father, for teaching us. Now give us the grace to do what we find in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.